So Terry, to understand our agricultural economy, we really need to look at the domestic economy and probably even more so the global economy. Where do we sit right now? Well, I think what we're, where we're sitting right now is we're seeing a, a great deal of softness on the global economy. The U.S. economy, from the consumer standpoint, is pretty resilient at this point. It's not outstanding, but it's pretty solid in terms of demand. Uh, the problem is on the global side, where we're just not seeing growth in demand. And, uh, you know, we're not seeing a collapse in demand. But as agriculture begins to expand production, as we're getting better yields, record yields, we're talking about record corn crops and so forth, uh, you need growing demand to absorb that. And, and we're just not seeing it. And I think that's the problem. When you look around the globe, you've got a lot of issues that probably suggest that we're not going to have a breakout on the demand side. Um, there's just too many, whether it's Brexit in Europe, whether it's elections in France and Germany, whether it's a restructuring the Chinese economy, all of those things don't suggest to me that you're really going to see this real breakout on the demand side. So now the question is, how quickly does the supply side adjust? Mother Nature gets to be the driver here. Uh, and that's, you know, ag doesn't completely control how much production is going to occur. And we saw that in the wheat industry where we cut acreage and still ended up with a record crop. So, so Mother Nature gets to be much more in control of the environment going forward because of the soft demand growth that's out there. Mm -hmm. and, and I really want to have you go back and talk to me just a bit about the Chinese economy where the growth has slowed considerably and also those developing nations, those, those BRIC countries. Well again, when you look at China, you know, we used to talk about China, it was double digit growth. That was really kind of on and on. And now we're looking at an economy growing about 6%. Now we'd love to have 6% growth in the U.S. But for them, that's half the growth rate that we had before. Their middle class is not rising as rapidly. That's really what drives demand for agricultural products, particularly on the animal protein side. That's just not materializing. They're trying to restructure their economy. They want an economy driven by the consumer, not by investment in state-owned enterprises uh, and exports. They realize that's, a, that's not a long-term optimum solution. So that's where they're going. They're not going to change that pattern. That's part of their 10-year plan. Uh, they're on a steady course. And so I think we have to expect that that's really what we're going to get. When you look at around the other countries, you, the, the BRIC terminology, we used to talk about Brazil, Russia, India, and China. Uh, these were the new catalysts for global growth and so forth. Now you look at those catalysts and you find a subdued China. You find Brazil in the second year of a recession. Uh, with you know major structural issues that have to be dealt with. Uh, you look at India, pretty steady growth in India. There's not really been much deterioration in India, but it's not a very open economy. They don't really allow much access as far as agricultural products go, so they can't be the driver for us. And then you have Russia, which of course is imploding with regard to the energy prices. Uh, they're much more focused on uh, external activities on the military side than they are with regard to their economy. And so their economy has really collapsed, their currency has collapsed. Uh, not much optimism with regard to Russia, I think, in terms of going forward. So that doesn't leave us with much in terms of looking at uh, where are we going to find demand on the emerging markets. Uh, it's, it's a much softer situation than we would have thought two or three years ago. Uh, and I think what we're seeing is all of these countries have structural problems that they need to address and it's simply going to take time. Now let, let's pivot to the domestic market. I've heard the U.S. economy described as the tallest pygmy in that while we're doing better than everyone else, we're certainly not where we ought to be. Right, yeah, we're the best of the worst. Mm -hmm. and, I, and I think that's kind of the reality of, of, of where the U.S. economy is at. It's pretty solid from a consumer standpoint. Uh, it's pretty solid with regard to uh, uh, imports, uh, but if you look at the export sector and you look at business investment, it's pretty stagnant and so forth. And I think what we're looking at is a U.S. economy that is going to perform around the 2% level. Uh, that's really kind of the best we can hope for at this point in time, simply because we, like every other country, we have some major structural issues we need to address. Uh, in terms of immigration reform, in terms of health care, in terms of regulation, uh, in terms of tax policy, entitlement spending, all of those issues have been on the table for some time. That terminology, kicking the can down the road, we've been doing that now for four or eight years. Uh, we really have not come to any consensus politically or even I think in the American public with regard to where should we go with all these issues. 
uh, until we can get that kind of leadership that takes us in some particular direction, I think we just kind of bump along at this 2% economy. So has that uncertainty, has it slowed our economic prospects? Oh, I think there's no doubt about it. And you can see that to some degree, we have pumped tremendous amount of liquidity into this economy, you know, with, a, with quantitative easing by the Federal Reserve, you know, balance sheets of these corporations are heavy with cash and so forth. Uh, there's a reason why this cash isn't getting deployed into new investments and so forth. And I think it's, it's this uncertainty with regard to the economic climate uh, and policy-wise that really limits the, how much of that money is, is going to spent for new activity. Now we're seeing mergers, we're seeing stock buybacks, uh, we're seeing some overseas investment and so forth, but by and large we're not seeing the kind of things that creates jobs and gives, gives us a dynamic economy and so forth. And I think we need to resolve these issues. One, you know, make a decision is, is kind of the theme that I have. Make a decision on these issues. The business community knows what to do once you have programs in place and you've made decisions. But if you can't tell me what you're going to do with immigration reform, you can't tell me what you're going to do with regard to regulation, what you're going to do with regard to health care policies, I'm in a quandary from the business standpoint how to deploy my capital. You know, we've seen all the, the stimulus spending and you know interest rates at historic lows that last year at this exact time, same time we were talking about the rise that was going to happen in interest rates we're still at these historic lows is it all about to end well i think it's you know, i think it's going to end I, you know it's, and again i have to be very careful because we've been at zero interest rate for eight years and we predicted the end of that at least three times over the last three years and so forth uh, but the reality is this economy is too fragile to take a big increase in interest rates at this point in time. Uh, and I think that's what the Fed recognizes both domestically and globally. Uh, if we move interest rates, our currency is going to get stronger and we're going to be less competitive in the global environment and so forth. So I think the Fed's going to be very cautious about moving interest rates higher. Uh, I think we are headed for a higher interest rate regime. Uh, but I think it's going to be a lot of it's going to be keyed off of do we make some of these structural adjustments or not going forward. If we were to have a, a significant fiscal activity, big infrastructure spending, uh, incentives for business investment and so forth, I think then you would take the pressure off of monetary policy and you could probably move interest rates higher. But in this environment you're asking monetary policy to do the job of fiscal policy because you're not really doing anything over there. So I think the, the reality is if we would get actions on some of these structural issues, if we get some fiscal stimulus added to the mix, we'll probably give the Fed the opportunity to move some interest rates without having really serious impacts on the overall economy and so forth. Uh, I mean, no one, I would never predict that we've been zero interest rates for eight years. I mean, I, I think everybody, in negative interest rates, I mean, everybody is still trying to get their arms around what negative interest rates mean. So, so we need to, trans, you know, clearly we need to transition out of that environment. That's not a normal environment. Uh, and so I think the quicker we start moving on some of these structural issues, get to the fiscal stimulus, begin to get the economy going, we'll see a more normalization of these interest rates because we have really penalized fixed income severely over the last eight years. I mean, if, you're in, if anybody on fixed income over the last eight years, you've been heavily penalized in terms of trying to generate return on your, in your investment and your savings. Uh, that's going to come back to haunt us because th those people are going to need more assistance probably now than they would have otherwise, simply because they've got an eight-year gap where they had no increase in their income. So, so more pressure for federal spending. And I think there's going to be more pressure for federal spending, more pressure on entitlement spending, uh, you know, Social Security, et cetera. All of these programs get strategically more important because the fixed income side really has made no gains unless they've taken more risk and gotten into the equity market. And that's, that's the perverse part of uh, these interest rates is we've made people on fixed income take more risk instead of less risk at at, at the age in which they should be taking less risk, we've forced them into some other area to generate returns. Um, so uh, all of these things have, you know, there's unintended consequences of, of what we've attempted to do, and I think some of those are going to come down the road to be, have to be addressed. I, I do want to ask you more about the entitlement spending because, you know, we have heard for years now that there needs to be entitlement reform. But how does that even take place if we are in that scenario? 
Well, I think it makes it more difficult. I mean, I think you know, if you were going to get your arms around entitlement spending, if you'd done it uh, 10 years ago, before the baby boomers were so close to retirement, you probably had a better chance of trying to achieve it. But now all of those baby boomers have a very fundamental understanding of how important these entitlement programs are to them. And in many cases, their parents are still alive. Uh, so, you know, whether their kids go to college now is linked to these entitlements because it's taking care of mom and dad. It's going to be taking care of my wife and I as we get into our 60s. Uh, so, you know, there's a triple generation now that has a vested interest in these entitlement spending. And so it's much more difficult now to deal with those. Uh, but they are going to be have to dealt with. Now, you can do it with the tax code or you can do it with uh, changes in the entitlement side. Uh, but I think it's as you get the baby boomers get to be a bigger and bigger part of the game, it gets to be much more difficult to deal with the entitlements and so forth. Uh, but you know the the reality is the future is here now, and so you're going to have to be dealt with. Mm -hmm. And I, I think whether, whether we like it or not, whether you like it or not, it's you know it's it's going to mean a major change in the tax code and in in a reexamination of what we're doing with regard to health care and everything else. And that's not unique to us. Japan's got the same problem. Europe's got the same problem. Um, that's one of the reasons why there's this kind of lack of optimism about the potential growth rates now, is all of these economies are struggling with that same issue, aging populations and the need to provide programs to support that aging population with a declining labor force. Let me narrow it down to our agricultural economy. If we are going to have a higher dollar, it is going to make our exports more expensive. What does that mean for commodity prices? Well, I think it puts downward pressure on commodity prices. I mean, again, Mother Nature can change the dynamics of that pretty quickly and so forth. Uh, but I think we've already seen that. I think, I mean, again, to some degree, a lot of that adjustment is already cooked in to some degree, if you will, if you look at these current price levels. I don't know that we're going to push these prices other than a a tremendously abundant crop again, uh, you know, we're, we're going to push them a great deal lower and so forth. I think we're finding the bottoms in these prices to some degree in this commodity cycle. But a lot will depend on all these things that we talked about. How quickly will these countries address their structural uh, transformation problems? Uh, <clears throat> how quickly will we get to a normalization of interest rates, uh, et cetera, et cetera. So, so, you know, I think for agriculture, the, the, the dollar obviously works against you. It keeps you less competitive in the global environment and so forth. Mm -hmm. uh, the question really is going to become, do we make some of the needed production adjustments? And, you know, you go back historically, we have, it's not like we haven't been here before. Yeah. I mean, if you go back and look, in, in the 80s and mid-90s, we had similar type accumulations of inventory and so forth. And, and they were resolved a bit through a surge in demand or, uh, <clears throat> or particular uh, adjustments on the production side. Now, we had... If you go back in the 80s, we had different, very different interest very rates. Very different interest rates, but we also had we had grain reserves in, we had acreage reduction programs, we had all kinds of of commodity programs that really were trying to control the supply, con control the surplus. We don't have any of those programs in place. Mm -hmm. Those programs have been have been moved moved aside and so forth. So as we go forward, that's going to be one of the questions I think that's going to be asked: is do we have the right set of farm programs? for the environment that we're going to find ourselves in over the next decade. Because we always do farm programs on the basis of history. Mm -hmm. So when we do a farm bill, we typically look at what's happened over the last five years and we shape a farm bill. We're gonna do a new farm bill in 2018. So it's gonna be interesting to see, you know, how, what do we think the environment is that we're gonna be preparing for? We have better crop insurance today than we had before. There's no doubt about that. Uh, we have price, we have price protection policies, we have uh, revenue assurance programs, uh, but are those the kind of programs that really lead to the adjustments that you want? Or are they the kinds of programs that just keep building your surpluses? So I th there's going to be a, a huge debate about you know, the next direction for the Farm Bill. Are we on the right track? And again, it's all going to kind of link into this fiscal policy thing. How much money is available? Mm -hmm to do new programs, and how do we get the biggest bang for our buck mm -hmm. in terms of these programs and so forth. And so that'll be a huge debate, I think, for agriculture, for the commodity groups in terms of, well, what's, our, what's the best policies now for us, short-term, long-term? 
uh, because we've got a what I would consider a short-term policy or a short-term problem. I really could make a case down the road, you know, two or three years from now, that we could have a breakout on the global economy. That you know, that if we did these structural things in all these parts of the world, uh, we could have a really a massive amount of liquidation of liquidity moving into the global marketplace, creating jobs, creating demand, and so forth. And so, you know, I don't think you want to do a farm bill on the basis of, oh, well, we're going to just stay in this subdued environment. That's never happened. I mean, we're going to get this straightened out. We're going to deal with these issues and so forth. And we're going to find ourselves with, with I think, a, a renewed growth on the commodity side, another super cycle, if you will. What's going to trigger it? I think opening markets, India, tremendous potential if you could open their market and so forth. Get China's restructuring completed. They get back on track as a consumer-driven economy. The best thing you could hear is China is a consumer-driven economy from the standpoint of the food side. Mm -hmm. uh, so I think there's some, some real reasons to be optimistic out there a little bit. But we've got this, this gap that we have to go through where we really kind of deal with the structural realities. And if we deal with those, then I think we open up this opportunity for, for kind of a new super, uh, super cycle on commodities. Uh, and, and I think it's out there. The question is, how far out there do we move it by inaction? Do we keep kicking the can down the road, uh, which pushes that, that reality further away uh, the longer we don't take action and so forth? And then on that bit of positive news, I will say thank you, Terry Barr. Right, thank you thank so you. much.